Hello and welcome to this module on stakeholders and corporate governance. This is a topic that's of great significance in today's social political environment, where fundamental questions are being asked about how companies and their managers behave and the role that companies should play in economics, politics, and society at large. In this module, we begin with a brief introduction to the topic and then focus on three core areas, the public firm, corporate social responsibility, and the various mechanisms of governance that one sees in modern corporations. The lectures on these core areas will be led by Professor Joe Mahoney, who has great expertise on these topics. I will then return to provide an outline of interesting current developments and conclude the module. I want to begin by noting that companies have always operated within a nexus of different stakeholders. These include external stakeholders such as customers and suppliers, the government and community, but they also include internal stakeholders such as shareholders and bondholders, employees and board managers. The success of companies has always depended on how they manage the interests of these different shareholders and balance them against each other. However, over the last few decades, managers and companies have increasingly operated in what one might call an age of shareholder primacy. During this period, and especially in developed Western and particularly English-speaking economies, the interest of one set of stakeholders, the shareholders, has gotten elevated above all else, and often to the detriment of other stakeholders. So for example, in both management education and practice, we often use the shorthand that the goal of managers is to maximize returns for shareholders. Now, under certain conditions, the problem of management can be reduced to this shorthand, but a quick thought experiment will reveal to you that this might not be universally true. If, as a company, I could pollute the groundwater around my facility without being detected for many years, and even pay off local governments to turn a blind eye, should I do it? Very likely, it would actually increase shareholder returns, but I hope you see that this would not be good management practice. Why then have shareholders and shareholder returns become a driving force in modern management? For one thing, it reflects the reality that public corporations take money from equity investors who are the claimants of last resort, the residual claimants of value created by the company, and so perhaps their interests need extraordinary protection. But it is also true that this shareholder-centric worldview has been driven by an intellectual movement in economics and finance that emphasizes a market-centric, neoliberal worldview. And last but not least, it has been strongly reinforced by the fact that modern financial markets are a very powerful force. Any CEO who is not careful about shareholder returns is liable to get immediately punished in the stock market and to receive pressure from the company's board. So with that background, let me hand you over to the capable hands of Professor Mahoney, who will explain the core topics of the publicly traded corporation, corporate social responsibility, and mechanisms of governance. In particular, we'll look at the, the publicly traded corporation, or sometimes referred to as a public stock company, which is the backbone of our economy. What are the characteristics of a public firm? Well, four key ones are first that there's limited liability for investors. Many, many people would define that as a key to a publicly traded corporation. The second is the technical term is transferability of investor interest, but what that essentially means is that the, the, the owners of stock can uh, buy and sell stock. The third one is called legal personality, and sometimes in the news there's a lot of discussion of the, the idea of the corporation as a person. The legal advantage of this idea of a single entity of a person is that the board of directors then is responsible for that person, to use that analogy or metaphor. That is, the board of directors is responsible for all of the stakeholders in the corporation and what's in the best interest of the corporation itself. Finally, the, the last uh, aspect that's uh, a fact about most publicly traded companies is that there's a separation of ownership and control. In particular, if we think of ownership as who gets the, res the, the extra income beyond paying off all the other stakeholders, well, that residual income or the residual claimant is called the shareholder. So in, in terms of income, the, the ownership is with, with the stockholders. But there's another meaning of ownership, and that is who has control. And typically, the managers have control. Now that means with a separation of ownership and control, there's the question of will the managers act in the best interest of the shareholders? Sometimes in, at the Harvard Business School, they call that OPM, or Other People's Money. There's actually a movie 
uh, of that title also that's kind of connected to uh, these problems of separation of ownership and control. It has uh, Danny DeVito uh, in it, as I recall. Okay, the next is this uh, picture of, uh, within many textbooks about the hierarchical nature of a publicly traded company. So at the top, you have the rules of the game of the state, and, and different states have different rules of the game, and some are more well-defined than others. So the state of Delaware, for example, is one of the oldest uh, states in the United States, has uh, many incorporated uh, entities within that state, so they have the most well-defined property rights of all the states of the United States and therefore a lot of companies like to incorporate in the state of Delaware because they they have less ambiguity about the rules of the game uh, when they incorporate in Delaware. Once you get beyond the state's rules of the game you also have the rules of the game of the corporation itself and the corporate charter of the company and in there there's a pecking order in most textbooks it's a, as it is on the screen here it's the shareholders who then vote for the board of directors. The board of directors have uh, responsibility for the management, and the management has responsibility for the employees. I will point out uh, a kind of a, a, a nuanced point, though, is that I just, you may have noticed a moment ago, I said the board of directors is in charge of the legal personality of the corporation itself, which includes all stakeholders. So in some pictures, uh, we actually would switch if you have a stakeholder view of management, which I do, right, this, is a, this is a stockholder view of management. If you have a stakeholder view, you would actually put the pecking order a little bit differently. You'd put the board of directors actually above the shareholders. That is, the board of directors is not only responsible for the shareholders, the board of, uh, the board of directors is responsible to all stakeholders of the company, and that's the meaning of the legal personality. That's the fiduciary duty of the board of directors. Next we have uh, the discussion of, uh, there's, there's many problems uh, in, in, uh, in, in all types of, of organization, including uh, our focus on capitalist uh, organizations. The final point I'll make about uh, this uh, slide on, on the public uh, stock company is the state charter of all 50 states in the United States are different and have different corporate governance rules. As we talk about different countries like Germany, France, uh, China, Japan, they each also have their own uh, corporate uh, laws within each of those countries. So in the same way that we have variation within a country, like the United States here, later on we'll also talk about variation in corporate governance across countries as well. And some of them have to do with this separation of ownership and control and agency problems, and so managers acting in their own self-interest, and some get very high profile, like uh, Enron Corporation, WorldCom, and Tyco. Enron did all type of things. And, uh, they're accounting, for example, uh, the, the simplistic version of what they were doing is uh, suppose you buy someone's house and you have someone buy your house and then you put it down as revenue for both of you and then you barter your houses back. So essentially they don't do anything but the, the books make it look like they're collecting lots of revenue and trying to move up their stock price and get more bonuses and things like that. Uh, the, the second is, uh, of course, the global financial crisis and the real estate bubble burst, and uh, that also is, uh, you know, real estate folks got a lot of money when they when they made these these deals, and often they would make deals with people that uh, really had no ability to pay back. And as you have more and more houses like that on the market, ev eventually there's a collapse uh, in the pricing, and that's what occurred in the United States for the uh, for the uh, real estate bubble. What, the, what these examples then show is that managerial actions affect the economy. For example, the, the Enron one, they, they also were in California, they deliberately manipulated the, the energy uh, and deliberately had shortages, and then you had blackouts in the state of California, you had the, uh, the rescinding of uh, the, the governor uh, in California, and in his place came Arnold Schwarzenegger onto the scene. I mean, all that came about uh, largely because of the actions of uh, Enron, and their manipulations in the state of California. So these ethical business procedures uh, do influence the, uh, w when they're in place, have positive impacts, and when they're not in place, they can have very negative impacts and, and destroy value uh, in the economy. So the bottom line is uh, that stakeholder management is quite important and needed. So your question for discussion is, consider the case of a pharmaceutical company that discovers a drug that can cure a disease that's prevalent in Africa. Suppose this drug is, uh, drug is projected to provide very low economic returns if the pharmaceutical company distributes the drug in Africa. This is a real question for many pharmaceutical companies. Is should the pharmaceutical company go ahead with the distribution of the drug 
and on what basis do you defend your decision? Please reflect on this question and post your response in the discussions for this video. Thank you. We've been discussing the idea of uh, stakeholder analysis, and here would be the kind of the, the step-by-step uh, procedures or routines for doing a stakeholder impact analysis. The first question is to ask who are the stakeholders. We might consider the employees, the customers, the suppliers, uh, the community. Uh, so wh whoever can, can be affected or affect uh, the corporation are typically included as stakeholders. The next thing is what are the stakeholders' interests and claims? You just had a discussion about the pharmaceutical industries and the giving away of drugs. So, for example, the people in uh, the, those patients in Africa are definitely going to be for giving away the drug. Perhaps the, the shareholders might be against giving away the drug. The employees might be varied. If they're the scientists in the company, they don't know the meaning of NPV or not that interested in the shareholder wealth unless they're a company that has a lot of the scientists have stock options, which is not is not uh, always the case. So they may be much more focused on scientific problems. They're not, and, and, and they're, they're in the, the, the company to have an impact positively on the world in terms of the drugs they're providing. So they might actually be for the distribution of the drug. And then as a manager, you have to think about, you got pressures from the shareholders saying, don't do it. You got pressures from your employees saying, do, do it. If the, if the scientists are the key employees of the company and they're gonna walk if you don't do it, then the shareholder wealth can be affected there as well because uh, a lot of the value of the company is in the employees. So managers uh, in many companies, whether they want to or not, cannot simply have a, a simplified version of just maximize uh, the share price because that's actually much, very much intertwined with the decisions of the stakeholders. So the next step in the process then is what are all the opportunities and threats to all these stakeholders present and that we need to do a systematic analysis of all the stakeholder groups and what are their interests and really what you're trying to get is a decision that keeps the coalition together. That you, you, you don't have the employees walk, you don't have the shareholders in mass sell off the stock. Uh, so so you're, you're just trying to, a manager you can think of is just trying to balance in some ways and in a positive sense of the word politician which is not always, we don't use that term always in a positive way, but in a positive sense of a politician of the polity of keeping Keeping the, keeping the organization together and making sure that key, uh, matter of fact, the, the most important stakeholder you don't want exiting are your customers. The next step it, then is to think about what economic, legal, ethical, and philanthropic responsibilities do we have to the stakeholders. So those are all different levels of analysis and in our next video we'll actually uh, discuss, uh, discuss uh, what's called the, peer, the corporate social responsibility pyramid. Finally, the last step is uh, what should we do to effectively address the stakeholder concerns? So the stakeholder impact analysis is, is really looking at what impacts corporate performance and it's looking at issues of corporate governance, which we'll get to uh, in more detail in the next two videos. It also looks at business ethics and then it also uh, looks at uh, social uh, issues of social responsibility. So that's it for this time, and I look forward to seeing you for the next video. Thank you.